trust to the Lord till I die. For I have the blessed assurance, and Jesus is mine.
continue our worship today with our responsive reading coming from the Book of Romans, chapter 8, 31 through 34, and 37 through 39. And we will be reading responsively. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither the angels nor deities, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God altogether. That is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus is my portion oh, yes. 
a constant friend is he, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. God, you are our refuge and strength. You are a very present help for us in the time of trouble. So God, we come to you today bowing in your presence, God, with thanksgiving in our hearts, Lord God, knowing that even in the midst of so much pain, so much sorrow, and so much confusion, God, that your eye is on the sparrow, and we know that you are watching over us. So, Lord, even in the midst of our hurt and pain, we sing because we are happy. Yes, yes, yes. And we sing, Lord, because we are free, yes, Lord. knowing that your eye is on the sparrow and you are watching over us, God. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, we say thank you today. Thank you. Thank you, Lord God, that in our times we can run to you and your arms are wide open, that you will embrace us and love us just where we are. So, God, we are thankful today that you, Lord, found in that robbery, but to go by way of the cross to give your life a ransom that we can be free today, Lord. So we say thank you, Lord God. And before, Lord, we petition you for anything, we do ask your forgiveness. Search our hearts today, Lord, and know us if there's anything, Lord, that's not pleasing in your sight. God, move it today and lead us in the path of eternal life. So, Lord, create in us clean hearts, renew a right spirit within us, Lord God. That when we come before you, God, we can come before you humbly with thanksgiving in our hearts. And, Lord God, we come now thanking you for strength. Oh, God, every where we go, everybody we talk to are sharing right now what seems like the burdens of life are weighing us down. But God, as your people, we come boldly to the throne of grace today knowing that you are our strength, Lord God. That you are our comfort, Lord God. You are our peace, our deliverance, our healer. Whatever our needs are today, God, we know that we can find it at the foot of the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, God. So we, as always, say thank you, Lord God. For even though we are going through the valleys of the shadows of death, Lord, we know that you are with us. We know that your rod and your staff will comfort us. And God, even when the enemy comes upon us like a floor in blood, oh God, you will even prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies and there, Lord God. Oh God, you will anoint our bed with oil until our cup runneth over. Oh God, so we say thank you, God. Thank you, For a safe place today that we can run in to you and be safe. Whatever life may throw our way, we know, God, your word taught us that we just have to be still sometimes and seek the salvation of the Lord. So here we are, Lord God, in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of so much hatred, and the sad part, Lord God, is the hatred and anger right now is among your people, God. So God, we are crying out to you today 
For you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the light, God. And we know no one can get to God our Father without going through you, God. So we ask that you show us the way, God. Help us to walk in your ways, God. Help us to walk worthy of the calling that is put upon us. Lead us, Lord. Guide us in the way that you would have us to go, Lord. For, Lord, if you lead us, we know that we cannot stray. So, God, we say thank you again today. Thank you that your eyes are on the sparrow. And that as you watch over them, God, you will also watch over us. Keep us, Lord God, with your mighty righteous right hand upon us. Cover us with your blood. Keep your angels around us, Lord God. Protecting us from all hurt, harm, and danger, seen and unseen. And as always, Lord, we will give you the praise, the glory, and the honor, Lord, all belong to you. And we ask this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. 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 Isaiah, 
a voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Today I'd like to use as a sermon title, Get Ready, Let Us Pray. Almighty God, we praise your name and we thank you for your presence in our lives always. You're always there with us. You inhabit the praises of your people and you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so we thank you for this moment now where we'll be able to hear from you. Open up our hearts, our minds, our very souls to receive what you have for us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You heard me say before that when the, when the quarantine first happened, I kind of went into a panic. I was like, what do you mean we can't go into the church? What do you mean we can't gather together week by week? What are we going to do? And you've also heard me say that God had a plan. And God worked it out so that we will be able to worship together through this meeting, through our video, through our conference calls, and we've not missed a beat. In fact, our ministry has even grown because instead of just the people in this community that have been able to experience our worship, people all around the country and even overseas have been able to view our worship services. Isn't God amazing? Always doing more than we can think. And as much as our worship has been able to go out to other people, I, and I'm sure many of you, have been able to experience worship from other people's churches as well. I love Lakewood Church with Joel Osteen. Enjoy listening to his music and his preaching. I love Dr. Jamal Harris and Brian down at New Birth Church in Atlanta. And of course, you know that I love T.D. Jakes at the Potter's House. I have enjoyed being able to watch all these many different worship experiences from all others. And as you know, T.D. Jakes, a famous preacher, and he's got this phrase that says, get ready, get ready, get ready. And you know how it is. When you spend some time listening to other preachers, listening to other songs, listening to something else, you always get a little bit of it in yourself. So today I just want to borrow, allow me just to borrow that catchphrase from T.D. Jakes. Get ready. And the reason why I'm telling you now to get ready is because God is about to do something amazing in your life and in the life of this church. You've been waiting for a miracle, so get ready. You've been waiting for a breakthrough, get ready. You've been waiting for restoration, then get ready. You've been waiting for healing, get ready. You've been waiting for peace, get ready. You've been waiting for increase, get ready. You've been waiting for a move of God. God, get ready. You've been praying, you've been crying, you've been pacing the floor, you've had sleepless nights, but you haven't given up hope. You haven't stopped trusting. You haven't lost your faith. So now God is telling us to get ready. And the reason why I'm getting ready, and I pray you'll get ready, ready with me, because after two years, we are getting ready to come back into the sanctuary. On March 6th, we will be worshiping here in the sanctuary. Now, I understand that some of you are still concerned about coronavirus, and that's okay. We're still going to have the worship over the video on YouTube and Facebook. We're still going to have that for you. But if you desire just to, to get a little bit more of what God has, and if you're in our area, you're welcome to stop by and worship with us because you know and you believe that God has promises for us. God has promised us that we are the head and not the tail. God promises that we're above and not beneath. God promises that we will have life and have life abundantly. God promised that he will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. God promised that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. God promises that eyes have seen and ears have not heard. God promised that he knows the plans he has for us, so get ready whether it's in this church or whether it's in your life, God is about to do something amazing. <clears throat> yes. That's what God wants us to know. 
that he's about to do something amazing. You see, that phrase, get ready, T.D. Jakes didn't say it first. Actually, it was John the Baptist who was the first to say, get ready. And I wonder if, if John the Baptist was excited in his day as we are in ours. So let's look at the text. <clears throat> the Bible says that in those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. I know you already know that John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And Jesus once said of John, I assure you, among those born of woman, women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus also referred to him as a prophet, and that's significant and quite a compliment because a prophet was someone who boldly spoke for God, one who wasn't afraid to say what God was really thinking. Prophets were politically incorrect, and they often issued warnings of impending judgment. When John showed up, there hadn't been a prophet in Israel for 400 years. Then out of the blue walked in this fellow, out into the desert, into the Red Sea, wearing a rough, dark, camel hair coat, which was the garb of the poor, offering this one provocative message. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is a message of challenge and a message of hope. One reason that John got people's attention was that he lived in the desert, a tough area where nobody wanted to live. It made sense, however, for John to call the desert his home. You see, the Jews knew the desert as a place where God showed up for them. In fact, many holy men would go in the desert in order to get closer to God. Another reason that John got people's attention was that he lived simply. See, most of the poor people in Jesus' day ate fish and figs and barley loaves, but John was so poor that he ate locusts as his source of protein, perhaps drying them and adding a little honey, uh, wild honey, to sweeten them enough to, to make them grow down. And then John's appearance and his lifestyle spoke volumes. He said, I'm not sold out to the culture. I'm nobody's pawn. The man don't own me. I can tell you the truth straight up. Because when you have nothing, you have nothing to lose. Finally, John got people's attention because he dressed exactly like the prophet Elijah. And every Jew knew that before Messiah came, a prophet like Elijah would show up who dressed like him and talked like him. This was so people would know that God was up to something and that they needed to get ready. And so once John had, John had their attention, what did he say? He told the people what they could do to live a life that pleased God. And the first thing they had to do was to repent. See, when we hear the word repent, we often think of judgment and condemnation, fire and brimstone. Repent of your sins or you're going to hell. Repent of your sins or you'll suffer all for all eternity. People have used the word repentance as something to scare us and terrify us into trying to serve God. But is there anyone here who knows that even though I give my life to Christ and am born again, I, st I still don't stop sinning? That no matter how I try, sin is always with me? And that's the exact reason why we need Jesus, because we can't stop sinning, so we need his blood to cover our sins. So repentance isn't about stopping myself from sinning. True repentance is a change of mind. It's a change of heart. It's a change of disposition. It's, it's the making of a new heart and of a right spirit. See, the Greek word here is metanoia which means to change your mind, to change the way you think. And if you know anything about Jesus' ministry, 
It was to get to people to change the way they thought about God and the way they thought about salvation. You see, they thought that God was angry and wrathful. Jesus changed their minds to see that God is love. They thought that their sacrifices were sufficient. Jesus changed their minds to see that he was the lamb that took away the sins of the world. They thought that they could earn their own salvation. Jesus changed their minds so that they could see that he, and he alone is the way, the truth, and the life. They thought that death was the end, but Jesus changed their minds to see that death was swallowed up in victory. They thought that Jews alone could enter paradise, but Jesus changed their minds to see that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus wants you to repent, to change your mind about the way that you view him, about the way that you view salvation, because there is much that we need to repent of. We need to repent of anxiety and fear. We need to change our minds to know that God has not given us a spirit of fear. We need to repent of self-hatred. We need to change our minds to know that each of us is fearfully and wonderfully made. We need to repent of pride. We need to change our minds to know that there is none righteous, no, not one. We need to repent of animosity among ourselves. We need to change our minds to know that God has given us a new command that we love one another. We need to repent of selfishness. We need to change our minds to know that if we give, it will be given to us, pressed down, shaken together, running over. We need to repent of rigid, self-righteous legalism. We need to change our minds to know that righteousness comes from the grace of God and not by our own works. Whatever the world has told you, whatever Satan has been whispering in your ear, I'm here to tell you that we are not of this world. I'm here to tell you that the devil is a liar. Don't let the world tell you everything you're not and everything you can't do. Change the way you think because you are worthy. You are capable. You are talented. You are gifted. You are loved. You are saved. And once you change your mind to know all of that, get ready for how God is going to show up in your life. Because we've experienced over this past two years, we, must, we once thought that God was only in here, that God was only in this church, only in the sanctuary. But God showed us. God changed our minds so that we can see that God was out there. That God is in your home, that God is in your job, that God is with you in your car, that God is with you in your praying con con pray that God is with you in your prayer closet, that God is everywhere, truly everywhere. And God wants to, us to know and change our minds that he wants to be with us more and more and more. God just needs us to think and know and believe that God is here, God is here, God is here. <clears throat> so what does it mean? What does it mean for John to say, the kingdom of heaven has come near? What John is saying is that there's a new way of life that will be ushered in with Jesus' ministry. That God previously has been out there ruling from afar. But with Jesus, God will now be with us, among us. That Jesus will rule in our hearts. Not Pharaoh, not Herod, not Trump, but Jesus will rule. Hmm. But how many people know that in 2022, we don't have to cry out that the kingdom of heaven has come near. We can cry out that the kingdom of heaven is here. But the problem is that too many people have a, have a near, a near Christianity and not a here Christianity. I'm going to say that again. Too many, too many people have a near, a near Christianity and not a here Christianity. You see, if you want to get ready for what God is about to do in your life, then you can't just have God near. You've got to have God here. You see, if, if God is near, that means, yeah, I keep a Bible in my house. But when God is here, I read it every day and I study it. 
When God is, is kind of near, then yeah, I give, I give an offering from time to time. But when God is here, then I tithe, giving God a tenth of everything that he's given to me. When, when God is, is near, then you know what, I, I watch the worship video, you know, when I get to it. But when God is here, then you don't just watch the video, you're involved, you're worshiping along with the video, and you're sending it to other people as well. When God is near, you see the church as just this building that worship only happens in the sanctuary. But when God is here, you know that you are the church, and wherever you are, that's where worship goes. When God is, is kind of near, you ask people, can you pray for me? But when God is here, you pray for yourself and you pray for others. When God is near, then you praise God for something good. When something good happens, you praise God. But when God is here, you praise God all the time. You are praising your Savior all the day long. You see, some, some translations, some translations say um, the kingdom of God is at hand, which means all you got to do is reach out your hand and receive all that God has for you. Reach out your hand and let God change you. Reach out your hand and let God grow you. Reach out your hand and let God use you. The kingdom of God is at hand. So put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself, which means to repent, which means to change the way you think. And then you can look at others differently. Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Get ready. Get ready. We are getting ready for all the blessings that God has in store for us. I, I know that there are areas in your life where you need God, that you've been waiting for God to handle in his mighty way. Get ready, because we are repenting. We are changing the way we think. Get ready, because we are stepping further, deeper into the presence of God drawing nearer, holding to his unchanging hand. But most of all, we're getting ready because we know that Jesus is coming back. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. You see there, the, the imagery is of a road in which a king will approach. Back in those days, it was known that when a when the, when the king was coming, when the sovereign was coming, every effort would be made to ensure that the road was as smooth as it could be, because the great one must be able to travel easily and quickly. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him, is a call to get ready to put out of the way whatever would obstruct God's progress and hinder God's complete triumph, whether those hindrances are public or personal, outward or inward. Get ready is for you, but yes, it's ultimately get ready Get ready is for you. Get ready is for what God is about to do in your life. But ultimately, get ready is about Jesus. Because God is getting us all ready to welcome his son back again in all glory and majesty, triumphant, bringing justice to this world, freeing us from bondage, and ushering in a new heaven and a new earth. So let us get ready. Let's move out of the way anything that would obstruct God's progress. Let's make straight paths for him. Let's get ready by loving our neighbors as ourselves, by making this a place where God's love is real. Let's get ready by praising God with our voices and our hands, with our feet, and with our whole hearts. Let's get ready by welcoming everyone and anyone who walks in these doors, be they black or white, gay or straight. Let's get ready by giving of our time, our talent, and our treasure. Let's get ready by praying without ceasing, because the effectual, fervent prayers of the righteous avail us much. Let's get ready to let the world know that living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified, 
freeing me forever, and one day he's coming back a glorious, glorious, glorious day. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready for what God is about to do in this place. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you.